global clinical global and actually the this is dr selvi radhakrishna my better half and we are here just to have a, a chit chat with uh, raghavendra who is just visiting india and uh, he is at the moment uh, professor and uh, Uh, head of uh, accident Ac- emergency surgery acute care surgery acute, acute care surgery at the university of michigan michigan and what are the, what brings to you to india so often so i i run a center called the michigan center for global surgery i also lead the india collaborative for the medical school so i'm always looking for collaborative partnerships and this uh, particular visit involved a trip to arvind eye hospital they have a very unique model of financing uh people with blindness in the who serve in the lower socio economic status i spent a day at cmc vellore where they are coming up with the level 1 trauma center which will be fully operational in about a year then i where we met each other was at Al- our alma mater uh, jipma where i briefly took part in a conversation on research in uh, surgery update organized by the department of surgery in jipma now uh, briefly uh, raghu um how how did your career progress after mbbs uh, for that matter where did you do your schooling and how did you come to jipma how was your stay in jipma very very short uh, yeah so i did sentences. my entire schooling and college i actually did my bachelor of science in botany before i uh, uh joined jipma i wasn't particularly smart enough directly to get into uh, medical school so i had to do 3 years of college because i was sort of goofing around having fun in life <laughs> not really studying till i hit jipma and i saw people like ravi who were my neighbors and who were studying all the time very studious and it hit me that oh my god i've been wasting all my life <laughs> and so i finished in jipma in 1985 then i did my internship i completed that in 1986 then i finished 3 years of general surgery in uh, at jipmer in 1989 was a registrar for a year and then i went off to the us uh, early 1991 hmm. and what is the, what is your progress in us the, in the us i started uh, residency in a hospital in new york in 1991 in 1995 i uh, did my third year fourth year and fifth year at henry ford hospital in detroit following which i had to take 3 years off serving uh, in r- uh, rural part of america to get a, what we call as a conversion to a h1 visa and subsequently a green card and then i launched myself in an academic career i did my fellowship in critical care at brown university in providence rhode island and then i started my academic career at university at buffalo uh, state university of new york in 2000 and i was an assistant professor of surgery and became an associate professor after 7 years uh, in buffalo i learned how to do research uh, through a mentor of mine paul knight who was the chair of the department of anesthesia there he was working on uh, aspiration induced lung injury I worked in his lab for a period of time and I got really interested in basic research related to direct forms of lung injury. I subsequently developed my own uh, rodent model for lung contusion and got my first NIH grant in 2004. Then I switched uh, to University of Michigan 10 years ago where I got my independent investigator award from the NIH I then gradually became assist associate and then full professor in 2014 so currently i work on direct forms of lung injury and various agents that cause a progression of uh, simple causes of lung injury to what we call as acute respiratory distress syndrome which is the fulminant part of respiratory failure and i typically concentrate on uh, specific areas and the two areas that i am working on right now are toll like receptor 3 and hypoxia inducible factor 1 alpha 
Now, um, how was it, how was that? Uh, are you do, do you do clinical work? Also? Yes. Fifty percent of my work. How is, is that you distribute uh, your time? So right now I am uh, I have fifty percent clinical work and fifty percent what we call as protected time mm -hmm. because of my research funding from the NIH. Mm -hmm. And the way it works in the US is you get grant funding. Mm -hmm. The grant funding at the level of uh, whether it is. Uh, intramural, that is, uh, uh, organizations within the university that you work, or extramural, which could be National Institutes of Health, National Science Foundation. There are other. Uh, Welcome uh, has uh, uh, specifically they are related to MRC in in the UK. So, so and we call as society awards. There are various society awards. So based on the degree of funding, you get a protected time because it pays for 50% of your salary. Right. And the rest of the time is involved in clinical work, which it also includes uh, teaching residents, medical students, fellows, and uh, mentoring junior faculty. Now, how did you uh, relate to the All India Institute Medical Sciences Trauma Center? Yeah. So in 2009, I got to know Dr. Mahesh Mishra, who was the chair of the Department of Surgery at the time. He was uh, the one who introduced trauma care to India. He started the first ATLS course in India. So he, we had a wonderful conversation in 2009, following which uh, we entered a collaboration with the trauma department at Royal Institute of Medical Sciences. We started uh, doing uh, research. We, uh, in the interim, we started doing uh, capacity building courses. Uh, so we used to come as a group of faculty members from the University of Michigan and uh, train their uh, junior faculty. Uh, each of these courses will last about five days. Will include about 30 odd uh, junior faculty from uh, All India Institute. We would be about five or six from the University of Michigan initially. And gradually that part was uh, offloaded to the uh, faculty members from Ames. And to date we have trained around 145 uh, junior faculty members at Alden Institute on uh, our research methodology course. Now what interest will you have uh, in training uh, Indians or uh, the Indian uh, uh, institutions? Because uh, this is a country that educated me. I was born in this country. I have a deep attachment to this country. Uh, and uh, this is my way of uh, giving back to the country of my origin that uh, was uh, good enough to uh, educate me and train me. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, anything uh, we can... It's, it's actually the, uh, what we lack basically like, but, uh, I think he was mentioning this, is questioning. Yes. So we are all very good and see like from very times we were all Rote learning was our strength. Exactly. And a lot of things in, in Sanskrit says karma parampara. Correct. So you just listen and absorb and then reproduce. And then even in even in traditional teaching, you reproduce and then start questioning what is the meaning. And then the questioning was to a very great extent actually if you look at all, you know, Vedanta people now, you know, connect quantum physics and Vedanta. Correct. So there is a questioning power, there is a questioning strength, but somewhere in the way we got kind of lost and uh, now our schooling whatever that mm -hmm. we do is only only encourages that road learning just reproduce score marks and, and, and then people have to go out to the country to actually learn to question and then research so where do you think uh, no, how I do you think we should sort of position ourselves? so I think it should start in the schooling system so if uh, if you uh, look at uh, uh, various uh, like I, I was uh, fascinated by this little experiment my daughter was doing in second grade. And what was their experiment? Every day they will take an orange, allow it to dry, or every day they would <laughs> take a weight of the orange. And the whole idea is how when it, things dry, they gradually, second grade. So this inquisitive part is something uh, you have to train you. It, it, it's a total, same way we train how to do breast surgery how to do same way you have to train your mind to ask the question the most important part of asking question is you ask a big question and to answer that big question you divide that question into five different parts so that in the end if a we hypothesize 
that uh, A is equal to B and then B is equal to C and C is equal to D and in the end A is equal to D. So you have to split the question. So the, the thing, first thing you learn uh, is first of all is the question important enough to be studied? Why should you be studying a question? Second of all, if you study the question, can it be answered? There are certain questions, such as what is the meaning of life, cannot be answered. So then once you figure out if it can be answered, how can it be answered? What are the various studies and methodologies we need to adopt to study that answer? So what we do in these research methods courses at All India Institute is, we ask each of the junior faculty member, tell me a question you want to study, write a page about it, and talk about it uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, how would you go about studying this. So because most of uh, people at All India Institute are all clinically oriented, they will ask, uh, I want to do a clinical study. And uh, then gradually over, we have group sessions, we have very few didactic sessions, we say, okay, why do you want to ask this question? Some of them say, okay, in the end they will change their mind, say, I want to ask a different question. Because now that you pointed out, it's not an important question to ask. If it affects a fraction of a minority of a population, it's a truly worth study. Yeah. Then once we figure out we are going to study this particular question or a clinical study, then they come up with an idea of, okay, now they will come up with arm one and arm two, and then through the course of discussion, we figure out maybe arm three and arm four are also needed for the study. Then it, gradually we distill the idea of the study and to say, okay, what are the specific endpoints you're studying? What's your primary endpoint? What's your secondary endpoint? And once you figure out the primary endpoint, what's the sample size estimate? And do you think at your institute you can do this? If this is going to take you 10 years to do this, then it's not worth studying. So gradually you, I think anybody can learn how to do research the same way anybody can learn how to operate and it just takes time and you have to make your mind go in a particular direction. You've got to think about why I want to do it, how I want to do it. And over the years you learn that scientific uh, rigor and uh, you know the reason why you, you should still be excited about doing research. See the Indian curriculum. I think we should also involve uh, Vidya in this conversation. Vidya should come. Vidya should not be allowed to get out of this <laughs> hey, place and no. not sit right Let's here. We are all surgeons basically, uh, two of us, three of us as a matter of fact. How did you land into trauma with the least glamorous of specialties? Correct. Well, nobody wants to be a trauma surgeon in India for whatever reason. Correct. So, for how did me, you get the, trauma? the attraction was uh, the critical care part and the research part. So uh, in trauma, um, the research I do, it, it, it should link up with the work you do clinically. For instance, if I do trauma for a living and I study breast cancer in my lab, it doesn't make any sense. Right. So it makes sense for you to study. So if you look at all the, the various disciplines, one of the most uh, uh, intriguing aspects is related to critical illness. So trauma is a critical illness. Uh, in, in the US, uh, the surgeons are trained to do critical care. So we, uh, the surgeons do their own critical care. So it, we used to be called trauma and critical care. Now it is called acute care surgery because we also do emergency surgery. And the research part is, was so appealing to me that uh, trauma became a big part of that whole equation and the areas of my research are truly related to trauma and the intersection of trauma and critical care. Now, you, if you call yourself a trauma surgeon, the anything to do with chest trauma, the chest surgeon will do. No, anything to do with abdomen, abdominal surgeon will do. Anything to do with uh, orthopedic fracture, orthopedician will do. Anything to do with the brain, the neurosurgeon will do. So where do you fit in? So, for us, when you are a trauma surgeon, we operate on the chest. We operate on the abdomen, we start operate on the extremity for upper vascular trauma. Mm -hmm. So the only things we don't do is neurosurgery and orthopedics. Right. So if there is a gunshot wound to the heart, we will do the medium sternotomy, we will repair the heart. If it's a chest trauma, we will do the thoracotomy, antilateral, postrolateral, depending on the exposure needed. We would do the necessary hemostasis and lung resection. For any abdominal trauma, regardless of wherever the injuries is, we will do the vascular repair of the aorta, pina cava, uh, and bowel resection, colectomies, anything related to trauma. 
So we, there is nobody, uh, we don't call anybody for trauma. Now you are a general surgeon to start with. We, to start you with. first finish uh, five years of general surgery right. in the US, that's yeah. the training. Then you do uh, two years of specialized training in trauma. And now how are you a surgeon of the heart and the aorta? Does it require uh, the basic uh, cardiac surgical yes. training? Yes. So we, hmm? I, did, I, did, I did four months of cardiac. Mm -hmm. In my residency, I did six months of ASCIL in my residency. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what has changed now is the endovascular surgery part. Okay. So, if anything that requires an open surgical intervention acutely, we will do it. Right. But anything that requires an endovascular surgery, we call our vascular surgeon. But in the end, the reason you operate on somebody is because of bleeding. Mm. And most time, bleeding is never in a single organ. So invariably it is, uh, say if it's a pancreatic injury, it's associated with small bowel injuries, associated with splenic injury. So we'll do the splenectomy, we'll do the distal pancreatectomy, get the, then, then take a look at other vascular things. And if something that we need assistance, we can call our vascular counterparts. But mostly acutely, we can tie off the superior mesenteric vein. You can tie off major vasculature because your idea is to save a life. And then you can do a little vascular shunt by time so that there is persistent distal perfusion and that's the time the vascular surgeons can do come to a proper uh, venous graft and a bypass. So you think that a uh, trauma surgeon uh, will uh, is a lot more beneficial in t taking care of patients of trauma rather than the combination of specialists working together? Correct, yeah. So there is pri the biggest part of trauma is priority. You need to figure out if somebody has a blunt trauma, for instance, is always, always multi-system. So you need to figure out, okay, in a hypotensive patient with a pelvic fracture and epidural hematoma, what's the priority? So uh, the way it is structured, at least in the US, is any multi-system trauma gets admitted to us. We are the primary caregivers, we are, we are the primary resuscitators of the patient, and then we decide who should be person A, B and C to be operating if it's abdominal. If somebody is hypotensive from a ruptured spleen and has an epidural hematoma that is expanding, these are rare scenarios where I'll be doing the laparotomy to do the splenectomy and the neurosurgeon will be doing a craniotomy to uh, control the middle meningeal hemorrhage from epidural. Otherwise, most times, if it's traumatic, severe traumatic brain injury, they will put a ventricular ostomy while I am controlling. So hemorrhage, bleeding organ takes precedence and the last of that order a priority is orthopedic trauma so which is uh, typically we wait till the patient is hemodynamically stable and is not actively bleeding so the priority the resuscitation and the priority is where our uh, expertise is so to speak now why didn't uh, trauma surgery come up in a big way in india what are the reasons Partly because, uh, number one, uh, trauma was considered uh, part of general surgery. Number two, uh, it's not financially lucrative. Uh, uh, essentially, most if you look at the patterns of injury in India, most of them are pedestrian accidents that have been hit by cars, and most of them belong to fairly lower socioeconomic strata. Mm -hmm. And uh, the networks and the emergency systems have not been operational for a long period of time till we got uh, the 108 system started. Uh, so the, there is a big part of trauma is organization and we haven't done that. So trauma never took off as a specialty. It is taking off now. There are a number of young people who are registering and getting interested in doing trauma care. A big part of it is it was always considered a part of general surgery. So that's why it never took off as a specialty. Whereas in the US it's been a specialty for almost 35, 40 years. With you have been managing uh, uh, trauma related intensive care. Now how do you see the role of surgeons? Uh, uh, will there be any uh, clash I, of... I, I, just to digress a little, I was pretty shocked by your question that uh, why did you take up trauma surgery with no glamour? I, I didn't say no glamour. I said, how did you? We never thought, for the matter, no, no and, and, and single general I, surgeon will no, ever I, think of taking trauma as a career. I was trying to just, uh, I, I was trying to be, you know, funny. But the point is that a trauma surgeon is the one with the maximum glamour. If you take uh, media, you take uh, television, you take 
uh, Where did you see? Have you seen anyone in that glamour? <laughs> she, she has seen George Clooney, Clooney in ER. <laughs> And she expects every drama surgeon to be looking like George Clooney. <laughs> so I, I, that's totally understandable. Yeah. So that's uh, that's actually. Uh, so if you look at it, um, that was the funny part. But even the serious part, I think uh, if you think uh, glamour is all about saving lives, I think trauma surgery was always glamorous. And uh, 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 now my trauma work has actually come down. Or in my hospital, the trauma work has actually come how, down. How? Otherwise. I mean, I mean the trauma in general. Yeah, yeah yes. in general, we are not getting the kind of uh, patients that he was describing, which it was like almost uh, every day or every other day. Of and of course, not gunshot, but uh, blood trauma, trauma, multi system. So at that time, because we didn't have a trauma surgeon, it was us who was uh, other than the actual operating part. It was uh, we anesthetists who were playing the role. What he is telling that uh, we we lead the resuscitation. We we were leading the resuscitation. We were prioritizing. We have to decide that it was our call like should the head trauma be dealt first or the abdomen or should the patient have, is the patient even fit to go in for a CT because those days a CT used to take 20 minutes. So is the patient stable, there, there have been times when patients were lost because even before we came in just because patient was unconscious somebody rushed the patient to the uh, CT gantry without, uh, without proper uh, resuscitation. So either the patient collapsed or you know uh, stopped breathing and uh, things like that. So uh, that way, I think medically speaking, I think trauma as uh, surgery is one of the most glamorous uh, things uh, and uh, very um, sort of like you said in India, Reward. very very much underrepresented Reward. and Reward. under uh, thing. Yeah. No, the, the very reason why I asked that question is in India has got the maximum number of uh, rotary effect accident related deaths yep. or whatever. And do you know the number one state with Tamil the maximum? Nadu, Tamil, Tamil Nadu. For density of population, it just is slightly ahead of Uttar Pradesh. And Tamil Nadu doesn't have any dedicated accident emergency. There is no speciality. organized state level trauma center. In fact, our transplant is better organized than our the trauma. Transplant. Whereas transplant caters to so one percent. It boils down to uh, money. money. Uh, See, uh, wherever private sector did extremely uh, well, and and yes. it, uh, the the programs developed. So Correct. trauma, like you said, yeah. you know, when the patient is injured, you know, whoever is walking on the road, we, the private hospitals cannot assess whether he can pay or not. Correct. So they don't invest on developing that Absolutely. specialty because... Uh, no, but what is the way forward? No, overall, broadly, I am into cardiology and heart failure. I think but we should also talk on He is into cardiac uh, transplantation, cardiac, cardiac transplant, transplant physician. Yeah. I am one of the few cardiologists in India with interest in heart failure now. I am promoting that here. So, for that example, I am telling in a broad way, I think in the MBBS level, if you are attending or addressing medical students, then these areas or these subjects, even I would request Raghu to forward it to the AIMS people who set up the so called curriculum in India, that they should introduce this ancillary or futuristic, whatever you call these subjects to medical students in the curriculum. So, like, for example, trauma, or you say heart failure, or trans cardiac transplant, or any other transplant, you know, transplantology they call it. Some countries call it transplant. And uh, maybe uh, similar ones, you know, like uh, maybe AI, as you mentioned, AI. So these things should be part of the curriculum in India, modernizing curriculum. Now, when they talk of modernization of curriculum in India for medical students, your Mishra also, Dr. Mishra also must be part of the present, uh, you know. Not at this uh, stage, but maybe. Maybe he must be there. Point, I mean, yeah. they are forming it. But uh, I think they should have, a, these subjects should be included. Then only awareness yeah. comes. And uh, same and thing with the research. So there are these specific courses organized, like, if a medical, when you are teaching a medical student and you don't give them the perspective, for instance, you talk about uh, chronic myeloid leukemia and you talk about BCR, ABL, transformation in chronic myeloid leukemia and unless you tell them there are drugs specifically that target that have cure rates for leukemia and lymphoma related to the molecular pathogenesis. A medical student is not likely to understand the importance of research. So the fundamental discovery part is not the sexy part of research. The fundamental discovery gives you certain therapeutic targets and in the end it's the therapy. A classic example being CTLA-4 uh, by Jim Allison and his group and that l has led to immunotherapy. And the results of immunotherapy for say lung cancer. Uh, and other, they are now using immunotherapy in melanoma. Unbelievable results. People who are dying in six months are now able to live 
five to ten years. So, so uh, the medical student or people who are starting to study medicine, if you get them interested in the final product and tell them that it is research and a basic discovery-based research that led to this fundamental discovery and future therapeutic targeting of a particular uh, molecule or a target, if you teach it that way, then there is a very good chance that they will gravitate and take it up. And Rathi is 100% right. How much of our education and curriculum was involved in research? We were told this is the amount of information. You, they, we were told you have to do the rote learning. Tomorrow there will be a test, there will be a written test, and then there will be an oral test. Both the tests truly tested our ability to gurgle out we the information it. that we studied. Nobody asked us to perform an operation. Nobody asked us to uh, come up with, uh, uh, say, scientific method or anything. That was not the way we were tested. So I think you are 100% right. Fundamentally, the curriculum of this country has to change. And research has to be introduced very early on. Who will introduce? Who are the persons and how will they introduce? You are saying something. Sir, can I just stop before that? I, uh, is it mandatory, uh, you think, that this kind of basic research, like actually what is happening at the cellu cellular or molecular level, is it necessary that you should be a physician to do that? That's a in, a, in a country like India where we are starved for physicians, are we going to train physicians who have to yeah. go back into the labs or are we trying to train physicians who can go out into the community? No, that's, a, that's a fabulous, she's asked a very pertinent mm -hmm. question. The, the big difference between a physician researcher and a PhD researcher, and I know my friends who are PhDs will be upset about it, but we have the ability to ask the right question. Correct. As a clinician, you say, okay, this is the problem. So when Ravi sees a patient with heart failure, then he says, okay, this particular subset of patients, I'm unable to help. Heart failure comes in various shapes and sizes and forms. There is this ischemic cardiomyopathy, there is genetic cardiomyopathy, there is, uh, 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 you know, valvular heart failure. Then there are these groups of patients you think have the ability. Some of them progress really quickly. Some of them don't progress. Now, the, to ask that fundamental question, who are the ones who've progressed quickly? Why are they progressing quickly? Why is this guy going to be requiring a heart, heart transplant whereas this person doesn't require? The same way, so I think only a clinician, the way I started my research career was I saw patients who had lung contusion and some of them which are large contusions, nothing much happened. Some of them which are really small contusion only identified on CT scan were progressing to fulminant progressive acute respiratory distress syndrome. So that's what started getting me involved. So a clinician asked the question and the clinician has the ability to ask the right question. Right question. And yes, it is harder for you to uh, train yourself in basic research. But research is also the way I look at research. Research is a question. And it doesn't have to be compartmentalized into basic research or discovery-based research or applied research or clinical research. Research is a question. Whatever it takes you to answer the question. Sometimes it takes a basic fundamental research using small animal models. Sometimes it takes cell work. Sometimes if, uh, if she wants to know uh, if it is HER, uh, you know, triple negative, there are certain groups of triple negative cancers that do well and well, that, that is a clinical question. So you do a, a simple observational study, an interventional study to look at those groups of patients. So you're, in the end you are answering a study, you are ask, answering a question that you think is relevant and to identify the question, I think if the clinician is able to do that better than a, a basic biological researcher. Now, uh, we have a lot of uh, youngsters who just joined, say, MS General Surgery. And uh, quite often they ask me, I run a Facebook page, uh, what topic should I take up for my thesis? Like, for example, if you are yep. asked this question, in Indian circumstances, in Indian medical schools, or just joined, how should they go about, what sort of topic should they take up? Yeah. So, I get this, ask this question all the time by our residents. In our, re our residency program is seven years, five years of clinical and two years of mandatory research time. Okay. 40% of our residents are MD-PhDs. 
So okay. they've already done a PhD mm -hmm. and their MDs. Mm -hmm. Still they do take two years of research to refine the question that they asked. So their PhD researchers have a very good idea of what they want to do. They link the surgery uh, part uh, to the basic research they did in the past. So for instance, if they worked on, a, on a, say, something related to, uh, say, epigenetics, they will look at epigenetics in, say, pancreatic cancer if they want a future in hepatobiliary. It becomes, so they have already figured out what their path is. So what I typically tell the residents is, okay, what interests you the most? And what are your, what do you think you have any aspiration, what kind of future you have planned in terms of your fellowship? If you are, most times people are very clear on what they want to do. So if, let's say somebody is interested in say vascular surgery, he wants to do a fellowship in vascular surgery, then it would look, he should look at a particular subject that has, uh, that he's going to be dealing with in the future in the clinical arena. The classic example being healing in a diabetic patient, uh, healing a diabetic foot, or or uh, the uh, way uh, deep venous thrombosis occurs in uh, various parts of the vena cava and the inflammatory reaction related to deep venous thrombosis. If you are going to be a breast surgeon in the future, then you should look at breast cancer. And you should look at, there are so many different, you can look at circulating tumor cells related to breast cancer. You should look at, you could look at the genetics of breast cancer. There are rare uh, genetic abnormalities like the BRCAs that are uh, high propensity developed. So you could look at the intersection of genes and cancer. So in the end, it has to be an important subject. It has to be something that is meaningful. It, is, it has to be a question that can be answered and it should go in line with your future clinical training. One question I want to ask you, since you are in critical care, what is the role of interdisciplinary uh, kind of, uh, no. either it could be one person or a group. For example, today we had a good discussion on ECMO, VV ECMO, it was interdisciplinary in the sense that he, he was leading the, our discussion on a patient and we had a patient on VV ECMO, ARDS patient. And then there were uh, intensive uh, pulmonologists, uh, cardiac surgeons, and I am just, you know, cardiologists, some parts of it are there. So, or how do you think it can be incorporated into medical curriculum, such type of I, I have, will have a hard time to figure out how to do anything without collaboration. So, I will give you a simple example. In my clinical arena, when I am rounding in the unit as the attending, I have my fellow, I have residents, I have medical students, then I have a critical care pharmacist. His knowledge of pharmacotherapy and pharmacogenetics is unbelievable. There is no way in hell he will say, no, this will immediately give you drug interaction or this is not the right drug for it or this is not the right dose or for this particular creatinine clearance, the dose should be this much. I have a basic science nutritionist or registered dietitian who tells me this is the formula you should think about. This is the total number of calories or if you are giving TPN, uh, let's omit lipids because there is a suggestion that in sepsis uh, giving lipids uh, will uh, worsen septic shock, so to speak. I have a respiratory therapist who will challenge me to say, okay, I don't think this patient will do very well in APRB. I think we should choose a spontaneous mode like pressure support rather than APRV. So every part of what we do in critical care is teamwork. At the end of every patient, the medical student picks up the chart and does what we call as ABCDEF. Is the airway, is the airway secure? Now the next question, can we wean off the sedation? Because the standard of care is spontaneous awakening trial and spontaneous breathing trial. Then they will say, is the patient uh, has the DVT risk been a risk appropriate is the patient. Now can the Foley catheter come out? Can the central line come out? Can the arterial line come out? So we go through this checklist on every patient and same way with research. I would be, I would not be here without all the collaboration and the systems I've had. I work with one of the world's leading authorities on HIF, uh, Yatrik Shah and Yatrik uh, trained at the uh, NIH and uh, he is a basic science molecular biologist who, uh, who helps me uh, interpret the basic science into the more clinical arena and, uh, with relation to my clinical. So I think 
if there is one thing I have learnt in life is you are nothing without your collaborators and um, any work, any clinical work, more people you involved, you give a voice including to the nurse. In, in our unit a nurse can say I don't agree with you and they are allowed to say that and then you can't just say because I'm a physician you have to do it. You have to say why I'm doing it, they are empowered just to speak up. Anybody can pick, speak up. The patient's family speaks up. We allow them to be involved in the rounds and then they will ask the question, I have read it in the internet that this is what you are doing, why are you doing this? So we try not to hide, we actually encourage families to be present during active CPR. There are a group of people who feel that they should be there for their loved ones till the very end and you will be surprised and you initially I said, oh the family said, doctor I want to be there. I want closure, I want to be there during this intense period where you are actively <coughs> performing CPR or coding somebody. So the family involvement we feel is extremely important. We don't have any visiting hours. Families can come anytime in and go in there. We have a certain number that we allow and we don't think it has any impact. On so in the end it is about informing people and I think collect working collectively is the key whether it is for research whether it is, uh, and the degree of expertise each person carries cannot be replicated. I can never know enough about HIF1 Alpha as uh, Yathrik. That's all he does for a living. He's one of the world's leading authorities on HIF. So I think collaboration and uh, ability to learn and listen to each other is extremely well, important. Since coming back to Radha's primary question, that uh, here there is a separation of specialties, primary level. So he says you are a surgeon. Or you take up trauma. So what do you think is the role of critical care? Why do you think you include critical care in our curriculum? For example, in PG level, I am not even saying PG level. Yeah. For example, Radha is a GSO. But yeah. there are a lot of common areas of critical care. Like today, yeah. you are managing... Vidya, Vidya wants to say something. Our primary problem is that our course is too short. End of the day, a three-year course, there is only that much you can do. So you want to train the person in research, you want to train the person in basic surgical skills uh, and also train them for uh, critical care, there's just not enough time. Yeah, and plus when you look at the course itself, it is structured so clinically oriented that the first three years you can still do independent practice, but for you to become an assistant professor, you have to do three years of being a senior registrar. So it's sort of a, this dichotomy world, whereas for us it is five years. And in academic programs like the University of Michigan, it's mandated that you do two years of research. So I, I think Vidya is right, it's very short. So I did, so our interns right now, in the first year they do one month of ICU, in second year they do three months of ICU, in third year they do two months of ICU. So by the time they finish in five years, they've done five years of ICU. And now many of the, the pattern now in the US for instance, the cardiac surgeons are ICU physicians, they are critical care board certified. So three cardiac surgeons in our group all trained under us as they did their fellowship after they did the cardiac surgery mm -hmm. and they run cardiac ICU one week and three weeks they operate in a month. The vascular guys, similarly there are two guys who are board certified in vascular surgery and critical care. Same thing with neurosurgery. The, there is shared between neurology and neurosurgery and they are neuro intensive care that means they did neurology residency and a fellowship in neuro critical care. So in the end you have to extend so how it. would you suppose you were asked to I mean suggest a person like Dr. Mishra who is in the board to introduce all this in Indian curriculum where do you think you can introduce? For example, you AIA have to or role of AIA, role so of So you AIA. have to which, which, look, which uh, I, I think PG there level, post PG level? Where do you think it can be incorporated? PG level, first of all, the dissertation that we have right now is a joke. Yes. So somebody writes it, your boss writes it, you put write all this thing, so uh, it's really not… It's just a collection of retrospective. Correct, things. exactly. Retrospective. So there is no, there is no uh, attempt to uh, truly reflect, that. that's really not research. If somebody does that, we don't call that research. Uh, second of all, we have to be realistic. I think there should be two clinical paths. So for surgeons who say, okay, people shouldn't be forced to do what they don't like. The fundamental thing, you will only do things that you like. So you say, okay, you have an option of doing two years in the lab. And the clinical guys say, okay, you have an option of doing 
one or two years as a clinical researcher, do a clinical trial or learn to do a basic epidemiology and statistics. So we call that health services research or clinical research if you want to call it and say you can take make it mandatory. Let's make it uh, say five years, four plus one, one year of research yes. and yeah, then expand the PG. Expand the PG, three, not one do one. that and then after you finished five years, if, if before you become an assistant professor, the research guy should do another additional one or two years of research. And if you really want to change the paradigm of research, you have to get them involved and tell them the same importance you give to your operation when you're doing a splenectomy, you want absolute okay. hemostasis at the end of it. Same attention you have to do when you're doing research. It can't be just a side so I have visited University of Michigan. I was with him for a month. So what I was impressed more is what point you mentioned first. Like as a surgeon, how do you also go into critical care? That's I'm right. not saying it's a research part. Yeah, yeah. For example, today he was discussing most of the topics were medical critical care. They're not about surgery. Yeah. Critical care is critical care. Critical hmm. care. So but you are a surgeon. Like as he says, he looks at you as a surgeon. But I'm board certified in critical care. Then you are a critical <laughs> care. So you are having three hats. You hold three hats. Yeah, okay. I do all that poorly. So now, <laughs> now, a person like us, like I am interventional, started with cardiology. Now I am moved into something else, transplant and all yeah. that. But uh, these are, I mean, these fields, now how do you incorporate uh, such uh, new paradigms into yeah. our Indian curriculum? Right. Now, Indian curriculum is like kind of as. as but it is changing, Ravi. Look at uh, 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 RK, uh, look at Selvi. If you have listened to her talk in Jipmer, you can make out this is what she does for a living. There yeah, is no way in hell you can come to that level unless you do it on a no, no, daily fine, but basis. That I would say is a particular branch, but still surgery. But what about interdisciplinary? I think that is more difficult because you know you go into BV ECMO, you go to VA ECMO, you handle uh, transport of patients, then yeah, uh, lung injury. Because that's uh, part like for this. So yeah, I think say vascular surgery. Eighty percent of vascular surgery in the U.S. is now endovascular. Yeah. That's not surgery. No, so you're floating gathered, this is what you go into. So if they could train expense. themselves out, same way we trained ourselves. And yes, you, you have to wear a different hat when you're a critical care doc. And when you're a trauma surgeon, it's a different hat. When you're a general surgeon, it's a different hat. Critical care in the PG curriculum. I mean, in it it should be integral part. Oh, okay, resuscitation, yeah. uh, identification, trying to figure out how, how to resuscitate, how to prioritize, how to take care of a sepsis patient. A perforated appendicitis is not the appendectomy oh, is not a problem you, there. You met Septic our, shock is the problem there. You met our ICU guys for that. So example they could relate to you. For example, Correct. you said driving pressure and yeah, yeah. whatever the ventilator, yeah. driving pressure yeah. and mean pressure and this and that. Then this case you have certain metrics. So you Correct. put some target metrics. Correct. So these are all typical critical care, you know. Correct. Correct. I mean target. Yeah. Now, if I can ask you here at this juncture, uh, Rugal, I'll just take a few more minutes because you know, we've, been just, we've been talking all yeah, through the last few like days. The fact that I'm the only one who's yeah. talking. No, 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 the, the, <laughs> the issue is, the, <laughs> the Indian medical curriculum, I understand, is British pattern. Yeah. Do British have the similar thing of a trauma surgeon being a critical yeah, care yeah, specialist, yeah. Come, yeah. researcher, and basic research? Good question. I don't think Britain has, but there is a phenomenal number yeah. of of, uh, of uh, physicians who are excellent clinical researchers from the UK. Uh, some landmark studies, of the, I, I think you are right that they don't fundamentally go into basic research. See this, uh, in the US, a large number of physicians are MD-PhDs. So it's, a, I won't say large, but a big part of academia are MD-PhDs. So they do first three years of clinical medicine, then do, do four years of PhD, come back, finish their MD, which is the basic MBBS of ours. Then they have now done PhD, so they have a very good understanding of what to do in the lab. Then they do their fellowship, and in their fellowship, they take a year off to do research. Most fellowships are three years, two years clinical, one year of research. Now this guy has already done four years of research. He does. You don't need to teach him how to do an ELISA or a Western or a PCR or whatever techniques he already knows, he knows how to inquire, he knows how to do the studies. So he takes that on more level. Now after the three years, now he's ready to be assistant professor. Then he goes, talks to the chair of the department of surgery, he says, I need protected time, I need money. Then the chair says, why should I give you money? Tell me what you want to do with that time and money. He has a project. He's been working now on research for five years. 
So he says that this is what I want to do, this is the grant I am going to write and with this grant this is the sign that I am going to do. So a chair, like anybody if you want, if you ask for money, the first question is what are you going to do with that money and tell me the return of investment. So if I spend 500,000 bucks on you, I am hoping in the end you will get grants which are worth two and a half million. Because nobody wants to invest in a person where nothing happens. So in the end it does bother, uh, whittle down to the money part of it. But it's return on investment, it is the glory of the department related to your research. So for us the research is a necessary evil. If you really like research, you're, you cannot get tenured without serious uh, research uh, funding, especially at the level of the NIH. I hope uh, things are changing also in India now slowly. Actually, the Credo workshops the last three years, the last three, four years, I think, mm -hmm. Tata Memorial, they have a okay. funding for it. This is, uh, they call it Credo workshop. Mm -hmm. So they actually encourage uh, people to, young people, they have an age criteria. And uh, so they, this faculty from all over the world, mostly UK connection and Tata themselves. Mm -hmm. So these group of people actually through a period of one week the same thing like you said, no, like the workshops you said they've been doing. So they've encouraged to come up with a question, with a question and ask then a question. and the different ways and then you know various steps of calculating sample size and yeah. end points and yeah. so there's taken through very clearly. Yeah. You know, what we have done with the uh, Orin Institute is so let's say there are uh, 30 people in a group then in the end you boil it down to four or five which are really good projects then each of them we connect them to a to a mentor at the university of michigan okay somebody is a nephrologist he wants to study pericytes there is a guy sitting somewhere in the basement uh, hiding away from the rest of the world whose whole life has been on pericytes there is no way you can match that kind of knowledge so you mentor them they have video meetings that they say, okay, I want to do this. Say, why don't you look at this? Why don't you look at that? So you mentor them, you develop a partnership with them. And uh, so we, we started one of the projects related to uh, severe TBI. And now we have an NIH funded study that we are doing. We are almost done recruiting. It happened and we started working with them as a group. Uh, Deepak uh, Agarwal was a neurosurgeon at Tallinn Institute and me from uh, the US. We started working on a project. So you allow them to grow their interest and help them in the process. Try this, try that. So if you have a question related to breast cancer that you don't know, you have somebody in your mind that you can call and email and say, how do you approach this? Like same, similar. Everything can be taught and everything can be learned. I think you have to have an open mind. So it's interesting uh, meeting you and that uh, person who started as a general surgeon, became a trauma surgeon, shifted to research and doing all the high-end research yeah. and you given a, a, a insight into what it all means and it's also nice to know that you're helping India in to building up. To, I, I hope more of that should happen and uh, I'm sure if any of our members uh, mail you asking a question or for some yeah. suggestion. I hope you'll be in a I'll position to, to answer. reply and sure. uh, that it's wonderful meeting you and uh, you know Vidya, Ravi, we're all classmates and you know an evening, evening we need to spend happily chit-chatting you know I just uh, pull you into this academy uh, uh, and discussion. You have, I must say you have a natural talent to do this. <laughs> I, I didn't come here to do this. Yeah. I, I came here to have a chat, meet with them, meet Shelby and you know. Anyway, uh, thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks thank everyone. Thank you. Bye.